Very, very large plateau. So why are these problems still unresolved? Why haven't we been able to figure it out? Well, the first reason is that the Colorado River is an agent of erosion. It actually is removing the evidence for its earliest history. And as the river chisels its way deeper and deeper into the landscape, the canyon gets wider and wider. And so any of those deposits that would have been left behind during the earliest phase of the Colorado River's history have been destroyed. We're probably looking for a, uh, the answer to a story where all the evidence has been taken away. And I doubt very seriously if any geologist will ever have the final say on how the Grand Canyon actually formed. Another reason that the Grand Canyon is, uh, these problems are still unresolved is because it's such a huge place. It's 280 miles long from Lee's Ferry, way up there in the upper right hand corner. And as you make your way past Grand Canyon Village and go along that river, it's 280 miles all the way to the Grand Wash Cliffs. You know that if there was an imaginary highway along the river and you drove it 70 miles an hour, it would still take you four hours to drive through the Grand Canyon. It takes a motorboat six days to go through the Grand Canyon. So who could walk every single inch of the Grand Canyon and understand how it formed? The answer is nobody. Another reason is that there's no economic incentive to understand the origin of the Grand Canyon. And here you see an oil well up in Utah. You know, when there's oil in the ground, geologists will try to study every single aspect of a, a region's geology so that they can predict where more oil might be. And you know, at this point, I might just tug at your imagination a little bit. I'd like you to imagine that the Grand Canyon actually had some of these minerals and oil and gas that are found in other places. And as you look at the inner gorge of the, of the Grand Canyon there, those are the type of rocks that oftentimes have gold, silver, zinc, or platinum. The sedimentary rocks above it oftentimes hold oil and gas. What would the history of the Grand Canyon be like if there were nuggets of gold to be found in the bottom of it? I'll tell you one thing, it might not be a national park. It might just be a big mining area. And we are so fortunate that the geologic forces that created the Grand Canyon's rocks did not yield this kind of mineral. Especially in these days of looking for oil, how would the history of the canyon be different if it contained them? Well, maybe you might see something like this. <laughs> now, I did not Photoshop this. Somebody Photoshopped it, but this was an advertisement in a oil and gas magazine. And that doesn't mean that they were promoting drilling in the Grand Canyon. It just meant that this oil company was willing to drill anywhere that, uh, that you could go to. And uh, of course, you could never do that because if there was any oil in the Grand Canyon strata, it has all run out as the canyon has been formed. There's a giant cut that's been gone through the strata here, and so all the fluids have run out, if they ever were there. I thought I might also just talk to you a little bit tonight about what carves canyons, what actually causes these canyons to be cut the way they were. And uh, you know, for many, many years, even when I was in uh, grade school, I was told that the sand and the silt that runs in the Colorado River slowly eroded the river channel, much like a way that a piece of sandpaper would work on a piece of wood. And you can imagine that happening very, very slowly. In fact, I heard a figure one time that every thousand years the Grand Canyon gets six inches deeper. And it was a great idea until they looked under that muddy water and they found out that on the bed of the river, there was up to 75 feet of sand and gravel and boulders that were protecting the bedrock and they couldn't even be eroded by the silty water. So there had to be another mechanism and that mechanism was the huge boulders that physically pound the river channel during huge floods. And here's a picture along Bright Angel Creek where you can see some of the boulders of the size that will help to carve canyons. So you can think of this like a giant rock tunnel. And when great big floods move down these streams, they move rocks of that size. And those boulders can physically pound away the sand and silt stratum that forms on a river channel and then get down to the bedrock and they start to break away pieces of the bedrock. But there is something <coughs> else that carves canyons, and that's the important thing, and it's called uplift. And here you see uplift right there. We actually lift the landscape up, and that's how these rivers are able to chisel down. 
So if you look at the top diagram, you can see a sluggish river flowing across the plain. But as the land is slowly uplifted in the next two diagrams, that river chisels its way down to keep its course to the sea. So uplift is necessary to carve canyons. And when you go to the south rim of the canyon, you're standing at 7,000 feet. And of course, the canyon is a mile deep when you're there as well. That means that if Phantom Ranch is still a half a mile above sea level, the Grand Canyon still has the potential to get deeper. So let's just look at some of the historical theories that have gone through time. I'll talk just a little bit about the native legends and the pre-scientific views. I want to talk about John Wesley Powell and Clarence Dutton. They were from the 19th century. And then Elliot Blackwelder, Charlie Hunt, and Eddie McKee. There were a lot of other people that have contributed to the story of the Grand Canyon, but I just want to give you a few of these, and we'll start off with the native letters and the pre-scientific views. And this pictograph found in the Grand Canyon reminds us that there were people here in pre-scientific time, and they sometimes had legends for what they saw in front of them, how that formed. I know the Havasupai Indians have a legend that there was a great chief that wanted to save his daughter, Pukege, and so when a great flood was moving through the land, he put her in a hollow pinyon pine log. And when the flood came through, not only did it save her because she was riding in the hollow log, but that flood carved the Grand Canyon. And the story doesn't end there. When the flood subsided, Bukei got out of the hollow pinyon pine log, she became the progenitor for all human beings. And think about it, there's the Havasupai Indians living in the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Their origin story does not take place in the Garden of Eden. It takes place in the Grand Canyon. In fact, all of us, ourselves, are the result of the formation of the Grand Canyon, according to the Havasupai traditional view of the canyon. Very, very interesting story. All the tribes that live around the canyon have origin stories for it. The first uh, real expedition that came to the Grand Canyon was the Ives Expedition in 1859. And uh, back in those days, there was a little bit of a conflict between the United States government and the Mormons in Utah. So this man, Lieutenant Joseph Christmas Ives, got in that very tiny little steamboat you see down there at the bottom. And he went on a steamboat all the way up about to where Hoover Dam is. And then he went overland from there back to Santa Fe. And in 1859, that was a very rough trip. Now, Lieutenant Ives was from New Hampshire. And he wasn't really impressed when he saw the Grand Canyon. He probably wondered why the Indians didn't rotate their crops. Because when he made a report to Congress, this is what he wrote in his report about the Grand Canyon. The region is, of course, altogether valueless. That just gives you a clue about what he's going to say here. It can be approached only from the south, and after entering it, there is nothing to do but leave. Mars has been the first and will doubtless be the last party of whites to visit this profitless locality. I kind of wonder what he really thought. It seems intended by nature that the Colorado River, along the greater portion of its lonely and majestic way, shall be forever unvisited and undisturbed. <laughs> Now, of course, if you come from farming country in New Hampshire, you probably would not be impressed. And in fact, in this time in our history, this area was called the Great American Desert. Now, people saw very, very little use for it. But we have to cut Lieutenant Ives a little bit of slack, because in the winter of 1859, it was very, very difficult to move across this country. He saw the Grand Canyon from the south side through the Walpi Indian Reservation. And every time that their Indian guys told them there would be a spring, it turned out that the spring was dry. And then the Indian guys would leave all of a sudden. They'd wake up in the morning and the guys would be gone. They had no idea where they were at. And they were sleeping on some very cold, hard ground. And it could be easy to understand why Lieutenant Ives, being from New Hampshire, was not impressed with the Grand Canyon. However, not everybody in the party who was under those same conditions felt that way. And this is John Strong Newberry, who was the geologist in the group and who immediately recognized the world-class significance of the Grand Canyon when he saw it. And he wrote in his diary something very different. Though valueless to the agriculturalist, I think he's referring to Ives there, dreaded and shunned by the immigrant, the miner, even the adventurous trapper, the Colorado Plateau is to the geologist of paradise. It has the most splendid exposure of stratified rocks that there is in the world. Now think about that. To one, it was a profitless locality, and to another guy, it's a paradise. This is a lesson to you. 
I don't need to tell you this, Harry, because you take my classes. If you become a geologist, you will die in a happier state of mind. <laughs> That's the lesson here. It really, really matters what your attitude is when you move to a place. And this guy with this big old scraggly beard, he knew what he was looking at. And he was a trained scientist. And what he also discovered when he looked at the Grand King, 